Well, let's continue our conversation about the Hogue Commission. Joining us right now are Susan Smith, principal with the Blue Sky Strategy Group, Josie Sabatino, senior consultant with Summa Strategies, and Anne McGrath, principal secretary to the NDP leader. Hello to the three of you. Hello. Hello. So it, I don't know how unfair this is, but I do want to begin with, with the Hogue Commission because you know, when we go through what has emerged, at least this week, uh, in broad strokes, the, the fact that senior liberals were, were, were informed, not necessarily the prime minister, uh, the fact that uh, the PMO officials said that CSIS never told them to get rid of their candidate in, in the Don Valley North uh, riding of Toronto back in 2019, and that with both 2019 and 2021, the panel of bureaucrats monitoring threats uh, against those two elections essentially said that the meddling did not affect the democratic process, nor did they merit a public alert. Uh, add to that what you will, and I know this gets a little bit of w ahead of what the commission is doing right now, but when you listen to the testimony and you are involved in testimony, uh, does it point to, to, to the need for a different process of monitoring potential interference and how that is shared with the political parties? I think so, and hindsight is definitely 2020 on this. The world has changed. I mean, we've got deep fakes. We are now truly aware that there is election potential for election meddling at a, a level that there didn't used to be, I don't think. And the fact that it's, it can be so granular without it being completely evident to people. So I think they do need to uh, look at a new process simply because the way people might choose to meddle has also evolved. So I think that's, that only is responsible in it to preserve the democracy. You know, of course, the Conservative Party uh, raised a number of issues with how they, they felt the information was dealt with and what was shared or not shared with them. Uh, what do you say to, to, to the process, Josie? Well, I think if you're an average Canadian watching what's happening, you can reasonably put together that the reason we're having this public inquiry in the first place is because the public threshold was so high for getting this information. And it was a result of the efforts of whistleblowers and the media to really put a spotlight on this issue and bring it forward. And here we are more than a year later, and we're now learning who knew what and when. So I really do think that we need to look at that public threshold and make a decision because everybody acknowledges that foreign interference was... Um, in the public domain in the 2019 and 2021 election. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what do you say? Now, again, you, you testified before yes, the Yes, I commission. did. Uh, uh, the three politi main political parties testified about what they knew, what they didn't know. I, I think what we're, what we're discovering is, number one, it absolutely was essential to have the public inquiry. I, I think that everybody, you know, when the special rapporteur said that there was no need for a public inquiry, there was a bit of an outcry, and I think that that was legit, because I think it's obvious that we needed a public inquiry. I think that uh, it's because coming clear that 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 some that people who had information that they should have passed on uh, we're not passing that information on um, and certainly we we made recommendations both when we met with the, the special rapporteur and in uh, this process about uh, how political parties should be informed and how they should be brought in and those kinds of things I think that the threshold for a public alert I'm interested to see where that goes because there are uh, there are downsides to that as well, having a lower threshold. But um, I, I think we're, we're discovering that people needed to know things when there when there were concerns that that, that the uh, security officials had. I think that uh, we're discovering that some of what was going on was riding level specific, and it seems very clear that they were really just looking at the whole picture. And I think you do have to get a little bit more granular. And of course, I'll be very interested to see uh, what the prime minister's testimony is because I think we do need to know. Who, if what he knew and and what he did about what he knew. Yeah, and and to be clear for people at home, at the time of this recording, the prime minister has not yet uh, spoken. Although we will have that in the program tonight. You were going to say something. The other overlay uh, is that it was a COVID election in 2021. We'd never done an election in a global pandemic before, and I think um, it's possible that foreign actors took advantage of the fragmentation of the mm -hmm. electoral process in this particular case. People were not getting together in big rooms, having big conversations, working in war rooms on the size and scale that they used to. And so it might have been difficult, uh, even perhaps for the security folks, I don't know, to add up one plus one plus one to get three, because maybe it, it wasn't looking like that at all. But I, it, we're back to a regular election cycle going forward. The technology and tools for foreign actors has changed. And it's clear that people in all political parties need to know in a timely manner real credible issues. And it came out in some of the testimony this week from Katie Telford that one of the things that had been put forward 
turned out to be wrong that the the officials had been putting forward. So you can't have a knee-jerk reaction to these things. It's very important. But I do think any responsible democracy continues to evolve its processes for this because there are irresponsible global actors that want to to take shots at our democracy. Mm -hmm. Did you want one more to, to respond to that at all? I think we really need to know what these recommendations are going to be that come out next month. That is where the real work starts, and this testimony was critical to finding out where the gaps are, and again, who knew what when, and we really need those recommendations to lay the foundation for the roadmap that leads into the next election. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, uh, and, and I, I want to go back to the COVID thing. The, the, if, when I think about the 2021 campaign, the primary issue was how to run a campaign during COVID. And that was what we were mostly preoccupied. I would not say that foreign interference was high on anybody's radar. And that's been clear from all of the testimony so far. But I think that the recommendations will be very important because I agree that, that going forward, we now know uh, a lot more than we did. And we need to make sure that we get the information that we need and that we know what we, what, once we get the information, we know what to do with it in a responsible way. Well, and, and to add to that, one interesting aspect was with 2019, the concern was about Russia and we're really talking about China now and how it, it attempted to, according to, to CISA, uh, interfere in the election process. So we'll keep monitoring that, the, the public even, push. Even, I would say even broader than that. Yes, like yes, 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 North yes. Korea, yeah. North Korea. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely, exactly. absolutely. And, you know, we'll say that the, the public portion has been extended. It was supposed to end today. It's been extended to, to allow another questioning of the CSIS director on Friday. So we'll watch for that. Yeah. But listen, let's move on to the budget. Of course, the federal budget next week. But already we're getting some big announcements and have been uh, ever since the budget day was announced. What does it say to you when, when you hear what has been announced and what's been prioritized by this government? What does it say to you about the, 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 the cohorts that they're trying to appeal to as they look at a potential election down the road uh, sooner rather than later and also still lagging very much in the polls. Yeah, so as someone who's been a kind of a communications or public relations practitioner for 30 years practically, I think it's a very clever tactic that the Liberals are doing right now. Budgets notoriously are big tomes that land on desks. Nerds like us get very excited and we look at things in them. But you know, it's long been said that it's fit, if it's a good budget if it's fish wrapped the next day, right? And so in this case, the Liberals are optimizing um, their announcements. They've made 10, five of which are related to housing. And to your question, they're targeting millennials, Gen Zers, and their parents and grandparents who have the concerns that this generation feels they have. I think the Liberals are trying to bring this these group of voters back into the fold. There's no question. Additional announcements were school food programs and mental health issues um, and more child care spaces. So they're aiming squarely at, <clears throat> excuse me, the affordability concerns that Canadians are feeling. And by rolling out these announcements kind of one at a time, they're able to grab some time in the news cycle and give people an opportunity to digest them rather than in the middle of their busy lives trying to wade through a 500 page document or just deal with the headlines and whatever the newspaper tells them yeah, is important. Yeah, at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, yeah. So, so, so uh, what do you say to that, Josie? I think affordability is on the minds of every Canadian right now, but when I think about the cohort that the Liberals are trying to target with a lot of these announcements, I have to think that millions of high school age kids are graduating, millions of college student kids around uh, Canada are going to be graduating and making decisions about you know where they rent and what their future looks like and I think there is a lot of anxiety that comes with the Gen Z and millennial uh, group of voters and that is really where the Liberals I think are trying to get back on track they're trying to make housing a priority and I think that is coming through in a lot of the announcements they're making but you know the devil is always in the details with these budgets and we also have to be mindful of how these spending promises are being paid for and I think that's where we'll see the Conservatives really lead in come budget day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yes, we will look at that number. It's certainly with the fall economic statement, that was a, a big question as to, to the amount of being spent and the proportion of the budget of that. But also interesting to hear the Prime Minister basically uh, say, you know, you, we feel your pain, we, the, your pain, your, your anger is legitimate. And what do you say about these uh, announcements ahead of the budget itself? Well, I agree that it's, it's a good way to do it. Uh, it's not new. I mean, it's been done in, in pro several provinces before. It's been done, I think it's even been done federally before. Uh, it makes, so it makes sense.
sense in that way because it does give you the opportunity to present a kind of a thematic approach to it uh, and and identify who your who your audience is. And I agree that it, it is uh, millennials and Gen Z um, and and the people that, that care about the, those particular cohorts. So I think it's a, a smart. There's going to have to be things in the budget itself too that have not been rolled out. So I'll be very interested to see uh, if people have been you know lulled into a sense of complacency and think oh well, everything's out there and not really pay attention to whatever tone we get uh, on on Tuesday. I think that's going to be important to pay close attention to as well. Yeah. And I think I personally believe that the revenue side is a, is an issue. I think would I'd have a different approach to it than the Conservatives. But I do think that uh, it's not just about a budget can't be just about spending. It also has to be about revenue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were going to jump in on that. I was going to say much of what you're hearing now is appeal at their kitchen table. The kitchen table components of the budget. There will be the detail in the big document when it comes where the technical stuff, where the the in- input tax credits or the innovation tax credits that have been talked about, the, the technical things that companies are looking for, you'll see, I think, more. that's where the meat of that is and always in the tables in the back of the books in the budget. But definitely there'll be more that will come. But I think the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister and all of Cabinet, I mean, they're doing a good job getting to the corners of the country as well as the big cities, are setting the table to say to people, we have been listening, we have been hearing from you, we understand housing, for example, is a primary issue. So I think people, it would be hard to say you'd missed it or you didn't know or there was nothing happening in this particular case, whereas if they waited till budget day to drop it all, there would be lots of people to say, why well, didn't hear about it. In this case, by rolling it out over a two week period, I think there's an opportunity there for people for it to register. Does it present an opportunity for opposition parties though to, to also form their, their, their counterpoints to what is going to be in the budget? Absolutely. And we've seen Pierre Polyev going on this carbon tax tirade and any mention of new taxes in the budget that will just set him off and his party. And I think we'll see more and more focus on the economy if those deficits pr- point to a large number in the budget. So those are the two points that the Conservatives are really going to be laser focused on. The third part of this is if the Liberals are going to point to growth as you know an area where they really want to focus the economy, people need details at this point. And I don't think they're going to be able to get away with top line talking points on the issue any longer. Okay, last word to you. Well, I mean, I, uh, the budget is a really important document. It, it is, you know, people say, you show me your budget and I'll, and I'll show you your priorities, right? It has to be a priority setting thing. So I think that the, uh, it's being targeted at, I, I think, the right kind of, the right people because, you know, you're right, every, there's no one in this country that doesn't, uh, isn't worried about affordability, mm-hmm. but there are some people who are doing very, very well and some companies that are doing very, very well. And I do think that there needs to be a bit of a rebalancing, uh, uh, you know, I, th- I think that, you know, when people look at groceries and and the uh, amount that's being brought in by the by the CEOs of the grocery stores and by the companies themselves there are questions about fairness and about equality and uh, and so I think ability to pay for these programs has to also uh, land on 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 the the wealthy CEOs okay well of course we'll be watching budget day but for now and Susan Josie thank you very much for the time thanks so much